Good to see everyone here today. Yeah. Amen. You know, uh, I'm thankful for technology and the ability to watch through Facebook or to sit in our cars or outside. But there's something about just being together, physically present with one another in the house of God, experiencing the move of the Spirit like we had this morning. Amen? Amen. There's no substitute for that. So thank the Lord we are able to, to be here and be inside together, especially on a hot day like today, yeah. hot and humid. Thank God for air conditioning. Amen. May God bless whoever invented it. Um, today we're going to continue our series. We're talking about divine direction and seeking the Lord. We're going to be um, talking today about faith to start. Faith to start. Let me ask you uh, a couple of questions as we begin this morning. Uh, do you want to do something good in your life? Do you want to do something good for God? Uh, it may be big or small. It could be uh, a goal for your family. It could be something on your job. It could be a business venture. It could be ministry to the church. It could be uh, doing something to, to help you regarding your health. It could be personal goals and plans. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I submit to you that probably the most challenging thing about doing anything in life is getting started. J just getting yourself in gear to get going is so often uh, the most difficult thing about actually starting anything, especially a new venture. Uh, for many people, uh, it's the start that stops them, is the way one person put it. It's the start this stops them. But you'll never finish anything unless you start something. So I'm going to encourage you today about having a, uh, a faith to start and then to follow through once you've started. And, and to uh, illustrate this and, and to basically to give us a theme to work with, we'll be looking at the story of, of Nehemiah, a very familiar uh, story from Scripture. But let's go back and review it a little bit again. Um, Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king of Persia. Now, that was a very responsible position. Uh, it was not only meant that he served the king at his table, which he did, but he meant, in some ways, he served as sort of a personal assistant to the king. He was almost a, a security guard in re one respect. I mean, he actually was responsible to taste the food to make sure nobody was poisoning the king. I mean, uh, he was, the king was placing his life in the hands of Nehemiah. So obviously Nehemiah was a person of responsibility, of high status, and respect to the king. Now Nehemiah hears that uh, the walls of Jerusalem are torn down, which I'm sure he knew, but the, the city is in ruins and nothing is being done to rebuild the city. Uh, just to remind you of how they got to this place, for centuries, the children of Israel, specifically here, the, the southern kingdom of Judah, had rebelled against God and followed after false gods and had rejected the ways of the Lord. And finally, God put up with it as long as he could. And he said, finally, I've had enough. And he brought destruction on Judah, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed the walls of the city, and sent uh, the children of Israel away into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. The people return. One of the first things they do, uh, first of all, they just begin to try to settle in the land. And after they begin to settle in a little bit, God upbraids them and, and rebukes them because they're not doing anything about the worship of God. So they, uh, under the direction of Zechariah and Haggai and Zerubbabel and other leaders, they begin and rebuild the temple. And after they do that, then many years go by again decades actually and they have a temple but the city is in largely in ruins i mean if, if you want to think about what it probably looked like you've probably seen photographs of what berlin looked like at the end of world war ii just buildings just shells of buildings whole buildings torn down everything in, in rubble and that's the way jerusalem was and in that day, a city without walls was a city without any kind of protection, any kind of security. So word comes to Nehemiah, this faithful servant of the Lord, serving the king of Persia, about the status of Jerusalem. 
And he grips Nehemiah's heart. And he mourns before the Lord. And actually, he, he begins to pray and to seek the Lord. And uh, he goes to the king. And the king sees his countenance is fallen, is down. And he asks him, uh, what is wrong? And so Nehemiah tells him what is wrong. And that his people are, are open to attack in the city of uh, Jerusalem, the city of God's people is in ruins and nobody has rebuilt the walls. And of course we know that um, the king gives permission for Nehemiah to go, essentially appoint him as governor of the land and to rebuild the walls. So that's the, the basic outline of the story. So let's back up just a moment before we actually get Nehemiah in Jerusalem and go back to when he first hears the news. And, and let me ask you this question that we're going to answer in the points of this message. How do you start doing something for God? Or in general, how do you start doing any change in your life? The first point is you have to start in faith. You have to start in faith. Now, consider what it says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, of Nehemiah's initial, his immediate first reaction to be heard about Jerusalem. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. What was Nehemiah's first response? Well, first of all, it was shock, it was grief, but then immediately he went to God. Immediately he began to pray and to fast and to seek the Lord. This illustrates something very important for us. If you want to do something for God, the first thing to do is to actually seek God. Or in general, again, you want to start something different, something new, a change in your life. It's a wise and responsible thing to first seek God. Take it to the Lord. Look to the God. And as we go on and read through the story, what we see Nehemiah doing is that he prayed to God, he confessed to God, he confessed the sins of, of the people of Israel, he repented for himself and his family and the, the children of Israel in general, and then he reminded God of his promises. In other words, in his prayers, he stepped out in faith and chose to believe in God. Now, now, faith is, is one of those funny things. If I ask you, what is faith? First of all, good Bible-believing Christians, you're probably going to give me the stock answer, Hebrews 11 and 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's true. And that's good. And we can pick that apart. But just let me ask you, explain that verse. What, what does that really mean? What is faith? Well, we can describe faith as being a lot of things. In, in this context, in, in Scripture, I think we put faith in these terms. Faith is complete trust in God, and faith is complete confidence in God. Now, now let me use an analogy for just a moment. Um, who can I pick on? Ryan. <laughs> Come up here, Ryan. Grab one of these chairs here off the front row. And I will describe this for those out there. Okay? And bring it over here. Now, Ryan, uh, do you believe this chair will hold you if you sit in? Yes. You do? Are you sure? No. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, Ernie might have come over early this morning and sawed through with a hacksaw two of the legs and they're just barely hanging up. There's, there's possible. That's but you don't think that's probably true? I don't think it's true. Okay, would you demonstrate your faith? Bravo, man of faith. Ryan King, give me a hand. <laughs> In very natural terms, thank you, Ryan. Yep. In very natural terms, what you see here is he had faith. In other words, he had confidence and trust that chair would hold him up. Faith in all, in one sense, any kind of faith it is a trust issue. It is a confidence issue. You believe. 
I will tell you, every time I get in an elevator, I am displaying a great deal of faith. First of all, because I'm claustrophobic, and I hate being in elevators anyway. And secondly, if you think about getting in this small little box that's held up by cables that my dad worked construction. I know a lot of construction workers, you don't know if that guy was as drunk as a skunk when he put that cable in or not. And you're trusting your life in the hands of you don't know who, that that thing's going to hold you up and deliver you on the floor you want to go to. That's a lot of faith. Well, it's funny when it comes to faith in God, we sometimes make it some kind of mystical, weird, strange. And, but faith is the same thing when it comes to faith in God. It is trust in God. And it's confidence in God himself. And trusting and confident that what he has said he will do, he will do. It's interesting to me, the Greek word for faith is pistuo. And, and the word actually means to place your confidence or trust, your faith into something or someone. It's not just believing something about something or own something or faith directed at something. It is placing faith in something. Faith is placing trust and confidence in God himself. I wonder if sometimes we don't have more faith in God because we don't really know him that well. I'm afraid there are too many Christians who really don't know God very well. Because if they did, they'd have more faith and confidence and trust in him. It's not just believing there is a God. It's not just believing in him in a very general sense. The Bible says you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. They believe a lot about God, but they don't have confidence in God. They don't have a relationship with him. The more we grow in our knowledge and understanding and relationship with God, the more our faith will grow because faith is trust and confidence in God. J.G. Machen, a great theologian of the early 20th century, said this, the more we know of God, the more unreservedly we will will trust him. The greater our progress in theology, knowing about God, learning, studying about God, the simpler and more childlike will be our faith. The more we know God, the more we have trust and confidence in him. And it's interesting, he says, that the more we grow in understanding and knowing God, actually the simpler our faith will become. The more childlike. Because it's simple trust. I could give you many illustrations of children and their absolute trust and confidence in adults and their parents. They have a very simple faith because they simply have confidence that their parent is going to take care of them. Or this person they have trust in is going to take care of them. That's the kind of faith. So if you want to start any venture for God, you have to be like Nehemiah. The first thing you should do is go to the Lord to seek him. And they have utmost confidence and trust in him. Secondly, after you have begun in faith, then you need to start and just start small. How many people want to do great things for God and they expect to do big, huge, humongous things tomorrow? Can I tell you, it doesn't happen like that. It rarely happens that something happens good in your life overnight. If it does, it's a miracle, usually. It's a supernatural work of God. Look at even the Apostle Paul, the great work he did for the Lord. Do you know from the time he was converted that he began his ministry? It was about 13 years. There were 13 years of preparation, getting ready for the work to be done. Moses spent decades for God preparing, getting him ready. He was 80 years old before he got started. Should give some of us hope. It can still happen. <laughs> you know, you, you got to be ready to prepare to start small. We go, we go back decades before this when they rebuilding the temple. And, and Zerubbabel, who's the, the son of David, is looking at what needs to be done to rebuild the temple. And, and he's overwhelmed by it, and God speaks to him. And this is the way it's written in the New Living Translation. God says this Zerubbabel, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work 
begin. Do not despise these small beginnings. Don't look down on them. Don't disparage. Don't, don't negate if you're starting out small and say it's no big deal. It's the starting that's important. So start and start small. And God will work from there. Look at what Nehemiah had to do. First of all, he had to prepare for a journey. He had to go on a journey about 850 miles to go from Susa, the king's palace of Persia, to Jerusalem. He had to get there, go through braving bandits on the highway, cold, everything else. He got there, he had to assess the situation. Then he had to gather the people together, rally them, and then he was constantly fighting the oppression of the surrounding enemies who do not want to see the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. In this process, he did gather the leaders of Israel together, the officials, the priests, the nobles, the heads of the houses. And he said to them in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in in Jerusalem. You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. And his gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began the good work. They just began. They, they didn't expect that it was all going to happen overnight. They didn't expect, you know, great results immediately. They simply began. You have to have faith, and you have to have faith to start. Do something. Just start. Even if it seems small, even if it seems insignificant, even if it seems in that big a way, start. Actually do it. Just, just, just step out of faith and do it. I, I can think of, of, of two different individuals I've known years past, so it's nobody here, nobody... I doubt anybody here knows any of these people. But I, but I think of two guys I've known, and both had the same litany of excuses for not doing things for the Lord, not doing things in the church. They are always wanting to. They were always going to get started. You know, one was constantly, it was his job. And I can't tell you, in, in the years I, I knew this guy, and I mean, he's probably still like this, that, that, that he get a new job, and, and, and he would tell us, my wife probably knows who I'm talking about right now because he'd say, okay, I got this new job and this new job is great because it's going to allow me to work these certain hours. I will make all kinds of money and what it's going to do is it's going to free me up to work in the church and all those things I'm wanting to do, those ministries I want to do, the things I want to do for God, I will be able to start with this new job. And six months or a year later, he get a different job, I never have done a thing to start doing anything in the church. Oh, oh, Victor, I'm so excited about this new job. This new job is going to give me this amount of money and it's going to do this and it's going to free up my time and I'm going to be able to do all this stuff I want to do for the church. God's, I believe God's got something in my heart he wants me to do. He's got a ministry for me. I want to do all this and this job is going to, and, and over and over, I saw this repeated pattern in this guy's life. He, he, he just never could get started. It was always some excuse, always some reason not to just plain get started. Just, just do it. You've heard me say before, I really wish some Christian had come up with the slogan, just do it before Nike came across it. It's such a good biblical concept. Just do it. You know, there are a lot of people who say, well, Victor, I want to do this for God. And I want to change this thing in my life. And I want this to happen different. And I, I feel like just looking at him and saying, do it. Just do it. Get up and do it. Stumble, fall, fail, blow it, make mistakes. But just do it. It won't be done perfectly. That's okay. Just do it. You will make mistakes. Do it. You're going to fall down. Do it. Just, just do it. So many of the great things we experience in life started out very small. Let me give you a couple examples. It is said that the first electric light was so dim that they had to take a candle to see where to plug it in. <laughs> or to unplug it. That's a small beginning. <laughs> How many of you have ever flown an airplane? Okay. 
first flight. I don't like if, if you read my recent thing devotion. You know, I don't like flying. I don't like being in a in a, a flying casket. <laughs> <clears throat> but I have flown. My first flight was was to South Korea. Okay, it was a horrible, horrible long trip. <laughs> Thirteen hours nonstop from L.A. to Seoul. <clears throat> I got so wrapped up in my fear, <laughs> I forgot my point. <laughs> First airplane flight ever, Wilbur over right, 12 seconds, 12 seconds. I flew the plane for over 13 hours nonstop. It began with a 12 second flight. I love this. The first cars, the first automobiles, only traveled at two to four miles per hour. <laughs> People on horses used to ride past them and laugh at them and say, get a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Started out small. Here's what I love. Uh, if I were on death row, God forbid, and they asked me, what, what is your last meal going to be? It'd probably be a cheeseburger from McDonald's. I love hamburgers. And I love cheeseburgers. Do you know the cheeseburger started with one guy, his name was Lyle Sternberger, who his dad ran a sandwich shop in Pasadena, California. In the early, early 1920s, he got the bright idea of putting American cheese on a hamburger. And it started out in that one little small shop. Some people liked it, some people thought it was stupid. It was, even then in the 1920s, anything coming out of California was considered a novelty. <laughs> <laughs> the New York Times in 1938 right, actually wrote an article because it's starting to spread across the country and said it would never catch on. Nobody's going to want cheese on their hamburger. And what are hamburgers today? You know, you can go to Moscow and buy a hamburger, a cheeseburger, excuse me. I mean, you can go anywhere. You can go to Beijing and buy a cheeseburger at McDonald's. It started out small. Those are sort of humorous illustration, but you know, uh, you've got to start, and you've got to start small. Doesn't mean you're not thinking big. Doesn't that, does that mean you're not expecting greater things? Does that mean you, you don't think God's going to cause it to grow? But you got to start and start small. Uh, it, it, Jesus is talking about our work for him in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. And I like the way this is rendered in the message. I can't remember if I gave this scripture to you, Paul, or not. So this is, this is a freebie. This is what the message, Jesus says in the message of Matthew 10, 42. This is a large work I have called you to do. So don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. For example, give a cool cup of water to someone who is thirsty. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true disciple. You won't lose out on a thing. That's good sage counsel for us. So have faith in God to start. Start small. Just start. And, and three, take the next step. Take the next step. Now, one of the things Nehemiah was challenged by was there were non-Israeli people around him who hated Israel and wanted to destroy them and did not want to see walls we built around the city. Okay? And so these enemies were constantly oppressing him. And when you see this in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it that they were rebuilding the walls. They mocked and ridiculed us. Ha! I have that in this. That's not even about it. What, what are you doing, Naz? Are you rebelling against the king? And I answered them and said, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. Now, notice what Nehemiah is saying here. You ain't going to stop us. We're getting started, and we're going to continue. We're going to take the next step. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're going to keep on at it. you got to have faith to start, 
You got to start and be willing to start small. And then once you start, you just got to see it through. You got to take the next step. You got to keep doing it. And you keep doing it and you keep doing it and you keep doing it. I've often said that where most Christians struggle the most and, and, and aren't as effective in their walk with Christ is the simple basic things. Going to church every Sunday. Reading the Bible, praying, <coughs> being faithful to tithe and to give. Just living right. Just, just do it. Following through, following through. Just do it. Have, put your faith in God, start small, and just continue to do it. You know? I, I do thank God that even though it can be a negative in my life, that my stubbornness has served me well. Because when I started out as a Christian, I purposed in my heart, I'm going to see this thing through. I am not going to quit. I am not going to give up. I don't care what happens around me. Who else quits? I've seen Christians quit because other Christians quit. They see somebody quit and they give up. They say, well, they can't serve Jesus. What, what hope is there for me? Well, I don't know there's any. Yeah, I do know there's hope for me because it's, it's not dependent upon them. It's dependent upon Jesus. I ain't quitting. I'm not going to give up. Do I believe it's possible to backslide? Yes. Are you ever going to backslide? No. Nope. It's not in the forecast. It's not in the plan. It's not on schedule. It's not in my agenda. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'll refuse. And what I do for God, I'm going to persist. I'm going to be stubborn about it. I'm going to be sanctifiedly stubborn. I am not going to give up. Just do it. So let, let me encourage you, whatever you want to do. You want to do a work for God? You want to do a ministry for the Lord? You want to bring change in your family? You want to be changed in your own life? You have personal goals you want to meet? You want to do something different? Put your faith in God. Start out doing it, even if you start small. And just don't ever stop. Persist. Francis of Assisi, who did more than just talk to birds and raccoons, said, start doing what's necessary, then what's possible, and suddenly you find yourself doing the impossible. That's a good thought. Start doing what's necessary, then what's possible. Then suddenly you will find yourself doing the impossible. You see, that's what the children of Israel did in this regard. They started out, they started out small, and they just didn't quit. Although the work was hard, although they were oppressed, they had enemies. They got to the place where they actually were fighting with, with trials and, 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 and tools in one hand and a spear in the other hand. Ever ready to fight the enemy. But they didn't quit. They continued. They kept through it. They saw it through. It's interesting. I, I came across a term I wasn't familiar with. It's actually, it's a biblical term. It's used several places in the Old Testament. And it's usually translated as, as a lack of self-control. It, it's the Greek word akrasia. Or it's actually conveyed into English in psychology. You use it and pronounce it akrasia. What is akrasia? Acrasia basically means not doing what you know you should be doing. It is acting against your better judgment. In other words, it's when you know I should do this thing, but you, against your own better judgment, don't simply don't do it. I remember when I was pastoring, I had an unusual congregation. I would have people from Virginia come and visit and say, Y'all put something in the water here? <laughs> I mean, there's just some unusual people here. And I can remember two families specifically. I mean, one lady who um, was, when we first went there, she was actually part of our worship team, and she was very active and very involved in church. And her job schedule started keeping her away from work. From church, I'm sorry. Yeah, it didn't keep her away from work. It kept her away from church. And finally got a place where, where it wasn't the job, it was just simply she got out of the habit of going to church. And, and it, this went on and on. We contacted her and tried to encourage her and everything else. And I can remember one time I went to visit her and with tears streaming down her face 
she told me, she says, Pastor Victor, she said, I miss church so much. She says, there's some Sunday mornings I, I lay in bed and just cry and say, Holy Spirit, if you want me to go to church today, just tell me so. <laughs> I, I very kindly tried to say to her, he already has. When he said in his word, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That is the word of the Holy Spirit yes. to you. You don't need another. I, I remember there's another family, same kind of situation. And, and they started missing a lot of church and missing church and fine. And, 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 and the husband told me one time, says, you know, my wife and I, some Sunday mornings, we're sitting at the breakfast table and we're just crying and oh, we miss church so much. And we just sit there and we Weep, 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 how much we miss church. I'm like, get up and go! Quit crying at the breakfast table. Go! That's a crazy, a crazy. A lack of self doesn't control the point that you know what you should do and you just don't do it. Now, we all do things like this. It is so easy to procrastinate, to put off. To avoid, to neglect, to ignore. And, and so often what it comes down to is it's easier to, to deal with the immediate benefits of inaction than it is to take the action that may be difficult, especially at first, to see the long-term future benefits. We live for the moment. Now, in one respect, that's good. But when, when it comes to thinking long-term, just do it. You know, when, when your conscience, when your mind, your heart is telling you this is the right thing to do, do it. Don't act against your own better judgment. Do it. And then keep on doing it. And if it's, if it's an endurance test to do it, do it. If it's hard to do it, do it. You, th you think your pastors never feel like sleeping in on Sunday mornings? <laughs> There's many a Sunday morning like, oh God, I don't want to get up. I don't want to go do that today. I want to stay right here. Is, is that even just that I'm reaching that I make myself come? You know? You do it because it's the right thing to do. You know? It, it, better than oatmeal. Maybe while we're real grumbly. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it. That's another one of the slogans I wish we got in the church before Quaker Oats picked it up. Just do it because it's the right thing to do. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6. Let us not become weary in doing good, but the proper time we will reap at a harvest. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up. Just don't quit. Don't give up. I, 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 I've told you this one time before I know, but I want to tell you again. I, I can remember, um, and I'm coming to a close here in just a moment. Um, the, 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 I used to work for a ministry uh, called New Life for Youth. It's basically a drug, uh, Christian drug rehab program, very much like Teen Challenge. And, and, and there were guys there. There's so many, most of the guys in the program came off the streets. A lot more were, came off the streets of New York and were you know, shipped to the countryside of Virginia and, and totally freaked out. They, they couldn't sleep at night because it's so quiet. They were used to sirens and traffic and all kinds of noise and they just were totally freaked out. And, and, and uh, I used to tell these guys, you know, they were heroin addicts and coke addicts and meth addicts and, 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 and alcoholics and some have been in gangs, some of them literally were, were thieves and murderers and, and everything else. And, and, and they would start out in this journey of the Christian life and and, and so many guys wouldn't make it through very long in the program at all. And, and, and some of them were, were repeat. Some of them, one, I remember one guy that we were about the fourth or fifth program he had been in. And I used to tell him, you know, you have to make up your mind you're not going to quit serving God. Just, you know, I said, if I could tell you, if you remember nothing else, I tell you, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Be stubborn about it, be resilient, be determined, be diligent, don't quit. I'm telling you, what you want to see happen in your life, what you want, to, a ministry you want to do for God, a work you want to see God uh, cause to come to pass in your life, something you want to see happen in your family, something you're praying for, something you're seeking for, 
a change you want, a difference you want to make, whatever it is, place your faith in God. Take those first small steps and just never, ever, ever quit. Don't give up. As we come to a close, let me just share a couple final thoughts with you. One man said this, The tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. The tragedy of life is not that it ends so soon, but that we wait so long to begin it. How sad that so many people wait so long to actually begin living. Job chapter 8, verse 7 says this. And this is your memory verse. You take this as a promise. Although you start with little, you will end with much. Although you start with little, you will end with much. Let us pray. Father, every one of us here has the potential to do great things may not be great in the eyes of the world, but great in your eyes. First of all, every time we are obedient and faithful and we serve you daily, that in your eyes is a great thing. But Father, I have no doubts there are things you're put on people's hearts. Things to do for you, things to do in the church, ministry to do for the Lord. Changes that happen in their home and their family. Personal goals, personal dreams changes they want to make, a difference they want to make. Father, there's so many things. God, help us, Lord, right now, through the power of your spirit, to place our trust and confidence in you, and then begin, even if it's small, begin, and God, not to quit. And to claim this, that we start little, we would end with much, when you are with us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Start with faith. Start small. And take the next step. I can't think of better wisdom than that today. I hope over these last four weeks you have gained some insight into divine direction uh, for your life uh, as we have looked at ways that we can uh, that we can find God's direction for our life find God's wisdom for our life trust in the process and then to actually take that step of faith and do that I was kind of hoping Victor you'd have Ryan stand at the top of the stairs okay. and let me and Nathan stand behind him and no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> like sitting in a chair that's pretty easy that's pretty easy I was wanting to see real faith in action I was watching the, the broadcast to see make sure everything's right I could see those stairs like oh I, he'd have told me I had him do that that would be much better <laughs> I don't think we could have probably socially distanced and caught you, so we, you might have been in trouble. <laughs> I encourage you today to respond. Uh, if you're here, respond with your, with your time to your connection card. Uh, the basket will be in the back, but you can drop that in your lead. Uh, memorize, that's a, Victor gave me an easy one this week. Uh, Job 8 and 7. I don't remember it. I was going to try to remember it from the back front. So maybe it's not as easy as I thought, but maybe you should work on that one. Let's see. Yeah. Although you, Annie's trying to mouth it to me. Uh, although you start with little, you're going to wind up with a whole bunch. That's a different translation than the one he read you. But I encourage you to memorize that. But, but seriously, memorize that. Check that box off. Make that commitment to memorize that. Uh, maybe make the commitment to ask God to help you this week. To, to trust in Him as you begin new things. And then ask God to help you finish those things, to, to continue to finish. Um, we always talk about New Year's resolutions. I've started more New Year's resolutions in a service than, than ever. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily bargaining with God, but 
God, I want to do this. Um, so pray God will help you to, co to continue. You know, uh, we talked about last week, he, what, he, what he began in you, he's faithful to complete. It may not be to the day he comes, but you can ask God to help you continue, help you keep moving, to take that next step, to take one step. Um, I'm going to re-preach last week's message from my care. One step. His word is a light into your path, not a light, not a floodlight to your future. You know, he's not shining a light so I can see all the way to the end. He just lights our steps. He guides our steps. So make that commitment. You know, respond with that today. Respond with your, your giving. Um, if you're here, that same basket is a place you can drop it. Um, if you're not here in your way, you can click on the shop now button. You're not shopping for anything other than a donation. That's what's in there. There's nothing to buy. But, or go to the website, c 3 peoplecom and give that way. You can do that here as well. And uh, give online. And, and what, respond with your giving today. Um, taking that next step sometimes means taking that step of faith. Sometimes it's faith to give. Uh, I, I don't know why I said sometimes. It's always faith to give. Uh, in, the, in the climate we live in, there is there can be that tendency to feel like when there's so much uncertainty and so much what well, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know when this will end or when that will begin again or whatever it is, whether it's your job, whether it's just the, everything around you, no matter what, everything's uncertain. Um, giving right now is probably the most faithful and faith-filled thing you could do is to give because everything in your human nature, in my human nature, says save everything I have don't spend anything extra. Don't do anything. Just keep it because you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, that, what that does is says, I am my source. So I better hang on to it. And when you give, you acknowledge that God is your source and he's taking care of you. It's one thing to say it, sing it, speak it. It's another thing to act on it. So respond with your giving today. And then respond with yourself today. As you, as you come to the table, as you come to the altar, I had this thought, I've heard this so many times, I've heard, you know, the, the altar call is a call to come to the front. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can, we can refer to this kneeling area as the altar. We call it that. Really, I heard somebody say this and kind of kind of struck me and it stayed with me. Something's not an altar if it doesn't hold sacrifice. So the reality is you already have your elements. So you have the altar where you are. You're holding it in your hands. This, this uh, little wafer and juice that we're going to pray over and bless and representing Christ's body and blood, it's there with you. you the reality is the altar is with you all the time because he, the Holy Spirit lives in you if you follow him. And I encourage you today, if you're at home, uh, take, take a second or two to, to go... You know, grab some juice and something that represents bread and, and participate with us as we come to the table. You know, we, we, we don't come in a closed manner. You don't have to be a member or belong in any kind of role, membership role. Um, and, but we do believe what the Bible says, that, that we don't come to this moment in an unworthy manner. And that means we, we believe that you need to be a follower of Christ. So hopefully you were in that place. And I don't say that to exclude you today, whether you're here or uh, somewhere watching this. Now's a great opportunity for you to be a follower of Christ. So I, I want to invite you. We're going to pray. and We're going to bless everything that's given today, everything we'll receive today, and bless all of you. And, and I just want to encourage you in this moment. Now's a good time to, to do like the psalmist David and search your heart. Ask God to search your heart. And make sure there's no... Uh, offensive or wicked way in you, anything that would block you from him, anything that would keep you from him. Ask God to forgive you for something you might have done. Or, and I've said this all the time, but now it really makes sense. I wish I could remember the word. I'm not going to butcher it. Maybe ask God to forgive you for something you should have done but didn't. Um, both are relevant. And just say, hey, listen, God, forgive me. Cleanse my heart. It's never wrong to pray that prayer again. Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. So I just want you to take a moment there in your altar, in your socially distanced space where you are, whether that's here or at home or somewhere. 
Now, you might be sitting in a Starbucks watching this. I don't know where you are, wherever you're watching. Just take, take a moment to, to, to let God look into your heart, to search you, and maybe become a follower. Maybe just ask him to cleanse your heart. Maybe just to, to bring you to that place in right standing with him. Would you just pray with me right now? God, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunities we have to, to respond to your word, to give to you with our time, with our, our, our tangible gifts, and with ourselves. God, I ask you to, to bring courage to someone right now that needs to pray that prayer and say, I, I want you to forgive me of my sin, God. I want to choose to follow you. I know that you came, you died, you rose again. You sit at the Father's right hand, Jesus, interceding for me. And I want to follow you, change direction of my life. And I, I want to do that today. Forgive me. Become the Lord, the, the supreme authority, the owner of my life. God, though I've prayed that prayer many years ago, I ask you to search my heart today. Cleanse my heart. Forgive me, God, for anything I might have done that would bring offense between us. God, forgive me for not doing, for, for if I haven't done something I should have done. God, just clean me today. Let me come to your table in a worthy manner. Not because I'm righteousness, I'm righteous, but because I come in your righteousness. Because you have cleansed me, you have made me whole. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you for everything that's given today. It will be used for your kingdom and your purposes beyond what we could ever do. Lord, I ask you to bless not only what we give, but what we partake of today. Bless this little wafer and this juice that it would be uh, spiritually in us. Even though it's, we don't believe it's your, your actual body and blood, we believe spiritually that it is in us and as real as you are in us. We thank you for this moment of presence where we acknowledge your presence in these things. Lord, I thank you that you took bread on that night before you laid down your life. You took bread at that Passover meal. You broke it. You gave it to your disciples. And you said, this is my body. It's going to be broken for you. Take and eat. And as you do that, remember me. Lord, we take the bread this morning. Take the bread. Lord, I thank you that that night you took a cup and that saved meal and you said, this cup is my blood. It's, it's a new covenant. No longer will you need to spill the blood of, of goats and rams and bulls and sheep. I am going to lay down my life and spill my blood for you. A perfect sacrifice. Lord, I thank you that you died for us, that you shed your blood for us, for our salvation, for our healing, for cleansing. Lord, today we, we remember you as we, we drink this simple juice. Bless it. Let it spiritually be you in us in a way that we cannot do in the physical. We praise you, Father. Let's, we take the juice this morning. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you for your promise that you will never leave us, never forsake us. Lord, I ask you to be with us this week as we go in, in your divine direction and we, we take the steps necessary to fulfill the call that you have placed on every one of our lives. As we take those steps in faith, as we seek you, your wisdom, your discernment, as we trust you, to lead us and guide us. And though we may start small, we thank you that you will help us to finish as we take these steps in you and we do it in faith, Lord. And we just give you honor in every way. Lord, and as a, a way to do that in benediction today, we, we pray out loud our benediction from Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you here. God bless you wherever you are. 
go and take steps for him this week.